who are joining from Europe. And uh, good morning for anyone that might be joining us from uh, North America. Uh, I'm really glad to uh, say hi to all of you and welcome you to Beyond Compliance 2, how certifications promote health, wellness, and sustainability. We did already uh, a previous session on the topic of green building certification and how it can be uh, enhancing our uh, health, wellness, and sustainability performance. I think today we will even more focus on metrics and performance. How do we drive performance both with monitoring and with uh, certified equipment, calibrated equipment, and at the same time, how do we have a process that optimizes the return on investment and desired outcomes from our uh, green building processes, both the planning stage, the design stage, the construction stage, and the operation stage. Uh, we have Nicholas White here, uh, Stanton Wong, and Graham Mills. Graham will be commenting after our two presenters, Nicholas and Stanton, will give us the overview over the subject. My name is Matthias Gelber. I'm really having a lot of fun uh, chairing all these Yuhu webinars because we always have a great audience and we have excellent speakers and real good learning. As usual, we'll kick off today with uh, a poll, uh, an intro poll. And our first question, uh, which I'm sharing now with all of you is, what will be the biggest benefit of a certification for my company building or facility? And you have to decide here, what is the highest priority for you? You can only click single choice. Look at all the options. We have better productivity and well-being of occupants or sustainability or energy savings, cost competitiveness, occupant retention, higher property value, higher rentals, general competitive advantage, tax incentive or funding, and lower emissions. Those are the options that we are giving you. Please choose one and uh, make your choice and click the one that is closest to your heart in terms of the uh, benefit that you are most keen on when it comes to building certification and driving the relevant performance. Um, I am waiting for a couple of more people. Uh, we have uh, close to 70%. I think we're getting ready to close and share with you the results. And uh, yeah, maybe one or two more people. Then we've got 80%. Yeah, we've got 80% now. That's good already. Let's see what we've got. I will share the results with you. Can you see them on the screen now? And we have better productivity and well-being of occupants as the number one choice. 40% of our currently present participants are actually voting for that. Then we have um, competitive advantage and higher property value, higher rentals, following with 20% each. And then we have 10% each sustainability and energy saving cost competitiveness. And that's it. So the clear winner is better productivity and well-being of occupants. And I think that's a great uh, confirmation at the start of our webinar. That's really very close to the heart of you who and close to the heart of the uh, presenters as well. So uh, without further ado, I will be um, handing over to Nicholas. You can share your questions as they come along, preferably in the Q&A box. That's the best place to put your questions in because then we can tackle them either by giving you a written answer or an answer later on in the Q&A section. We have both Nicholas and uh, Stanton uh, giving a presentation in the range of seven to 10 minutes. Uh, I'll have a brief uh, uh, question, one or two questions for each of them. And then Graham will give his comments from the perspective of a practitioner in the UK and uh, a, a Yuhu distributor on the two presentations that have been given. And then we will have another 20 minutes left for Q and A before we then finish with a short video and an exit poll. So I'm looking forward to today because I know the two speakers have both a lot of value to add. So uh, uh, first on is uh, Nicholas White, originally from the US, and he's the co-founder of Smart Building Certification. And over to you, Nicholas. 
Thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be with all of you. Um, we we love Yuhu and and seeing everything that they've they've done and how they're evolving as a company. It's it's fantastic. I thought that was a great poll. I think uh, one thing that I would maybe add is um, breaking down silos and getting stakeholders to communicate more effectively together. I think that that is one of the, the key benefits of certification. I'm gonna try and talk to you a little bit about smart building certification very quickly in about seven minutes and, and I'm open to all of your discussions. Uh, we were uh, discussing kind of how to deliver the best value for the audience you know, in preparation for this meeting. And what we decided was uh, kind of laying a foundation of smart uh, in, in general terms, uh, as the first speaker myself, and that's really what smart building certification does. It looks like at it from a very general perspective. And then Stanton, of course, from, from Reset, goes much more into detail on, on the actual built environment and, and the um, indoor environment and the, and the climate. So I'm looking forward to that, that talk as well. But we were founded uh, in early 2020, so we're quite a new initiative. Um, but it's, it's very much uh, where smart is right now. Uh, we're refined by practice in the sense that we're always improving, uh, constantly optimized, and we're, uh, we're built from a network of experts. Uh, we bring real estate, prop tech, universities, finance, all of those together to help us build this smart building certification. So uh, we'll talk about how that works uh, in this presentation. But what if I told you that the first smart building or the sm first smart solution was actually built already over 400 years ago? Um, we love this story. 400 years ago, uh, there was a Dutch inventor, Cornelius Drebbel. And what he did is he had a problem with, with, um, the, the, with a chicken coop uh, to get, he wanted to get higher increased egg production from his chickens. So he built a temperature regulation airflow system that actually just produced amazing results. And we're really encouraged by this story, uh, not only because of how long ago it was, but also for us to always think and, and be true to that, you know, there's a problem and the solutions are there to solve the problem. Uh, I think we get lost in the noise often. And I think um, it's important to always think about what are the problems we're trying to solve and, and then go out and solve them. If we fast forward 395 years, which is just a lot of time, uh, but about 2014, um, I live here in Amsterdam. Uh, the Edge was, was delivered by OBG. Uh, and the Edge at the time was the most sustainable building in the world, but they also went a, a step further and made it the first really smart building. Uh, and they put in uh, the first lighting systems with Philips that, that measured occupancy and measured movement. They had a user uh, application they had climate sensors, these types of things. And this stuff was all kind of unheard of uh, even seven, eight years ago. So this was really one of those first big, big moves into that space. Um, that OBG is now Edge Technologies and they are continuing to build a lot of uh, amazing buildings here. And we actually are fortunate enough to, to learn from a lot of the people that work on this building. So I think it's a, it's a really, uh, we've come a long way. But what is smart building doing for us now? Well, as we get more refined and we learn more and we are working as a collective, we're seeing that we can measure the usage of a building much more easily. You know, think about occupancy sensors, think about sensors on amenities and, and parking, and you can see exactly how your asset is being used. Um, and, and that is, is a major benefit from, from smart building. But beyond that, we see building performance, the ability to actually manage the energy consumption, the, the water consumption, the sustainability aspects of how an asset is actually delivering uh, can be managed much more easily with, with a smart building. And then indoor environment, which we're speaking a lot about today, um, looking at how are we making healthy environments for the users? Uh, think about proper air quality, water quality, light, sound, uh, these types of things. How are we making things healthy and more uh, productive for, for the users? Uh, with smart, we can make the, the real estate safer and more secure. Things are more complex than ever now with, with all the data structures and all the systems that are creating data. 
Um, so we really need to use smart to, to make things safe and secure. And then finally, user behavior and collaboration, have really good control over how we're delivering for the users, not only get allowing them to find each other and collaborate more effectively uh, as teams, but also how do they interact with real estate? How do they find the things that they need and get out of the real estate what they, what they need? Especially in this hybrid time where people are, are using real estate differently, it's never been more important to have a clear understanding of how, uh, how users are interacting with the, with the building. Um, so what is the business case for SMART? Uh, it's really the nuts and bolts come down to health, sustainability, performance, human performance and overall efficiencies. With SMART, we can increase all of these and improve them. And it's, uh, it's so refreshing right now in the built real estate space to see so much uh, motivation and movement towards these. Um, and if we do it properly, what we see is that it helps overall real estate value. Um, the, the buyers of real estate and the renters of real estate are no longer willing to um, to rent and buy without these things being taken into consideration. So we're seeing increased valuation from, from SMART. We're seeing a decrease in cost. Uh, what we manage and measure, we can uh, manage it more efficiently and effectively. So we can bring that cost, uh, cost down. Um, we're seeing real estate revenue that we haven't seen before. So we're seeing new business models emerge from SMART. Um, if we look over the last five years, uh, and, and if you, you apply SMART to traditional real estate models, yes, you can improve efficiencies. Yes, you can improve how the asset is being used. But actually, the SMART uh, developers who have been doing it now for five, six years, they're all starting to create completely new revenue models. And that is, is truly exciting when, when thinking about SMART. Uh, reporting ESG, uh, this is amazing that this has gotten so much attention lately and it's so needed that we are focusing on sustainability, uh, focusing on ESG reporting. And SMART actually allows us to do that more easily. Um, once you have that data, you can report on, on the different aspects more easily. So that's, that's uh, very encouraging. And then finally, ease of certification. Uh, if you see all the certifications that are out there, uh, RESET, which we'll be hearing from Stanton in a minute, as an example, LEED, WELL, all of these certifications, um, they, they all have a lot of expertise behind them. So they all have their place and they all have what, what uh, we see as, as real value for the, for the real estate space. Um, and SMART allows you to, to meet those needs of those certifications more easily. So it's, uh, if you're on the fence of, is SMART a good thing or a bad thing? It's definitely, something you should be focusing on and, and adding to your, to your building. So why smart building certification and what are we doing uh, in this space? Um, it's an exciting evolution of, of smart. Uh, on, on one side, the entire stakeholder map has become involved, uh, which, is, which is pretty new in the sense that the developer, owner, property manager, and tenant are all working together uh, to, to find um, the solution, and they should be. Uh, there are still a lot of cases where they're not, but um, we are seeing that all of them are now interested in this story. The applications of SMART have become endless, so it's really challenging to, to find uh, the, the information. There's so much out there. People are not starving for information. They're starving for wisdom. So that those applications, there's a ton of them, and uh, we really need to help help people navigate those, uh, those applications. And then there's an endless combination of solutions and suppliers. So again, we really need to find a way to benchmark against each other, share best practices, learn what's working, uh, learn what's not working, and continuously uh, find, find the, the best ways forward here. And then finally, those silos of stakeholders, solutions, suppliers, and, and case studies as long as we stay in those silos, it, it remains quite challenging. So we're really uh, pushing to, uh, with one language, one language of what SMART is, break down those silos and, and get everyone to speak uh, together. So that made, uh, that gave birth to the SBC methodology, SMART Building Certification Methodology, which was defined from a, a partner network. Like I said, we have uh, finance, real estate, universities, property, 
connect all of those uh, stakeholders together, constantly doing open uh, networking, we're doing events, we're doing discussions, and that is really informing the, the methodology. That has led to uh, uh, building certification. So we've been certifying buildings against the methodology, which um, is on one side very good in promoting your building as smart or in some of those areas uh, that they are smart, but also identifying the opportunities for improvement, finding the opportunities to, to do things a little bit different. And then uh, what we saw was a lot of the buildings were having challenging uh, times finding those solutions. So that led way to a, a solution certification. So we work with companies like Yahoo uh, and others to uh, certify the solutions against the methodology so that we really all start to speak that same language and the buildings can find the solutions when they need them. Um, and that's critical is that we, we break down those silos, share those stories, share those cases. And that's led to a transformational framework that I think is really adding value to buildings um, wherever they are in the process, if they're just getting started or they're the, the smartest in the world, um, giving them what they need uh, when they need it. So what do we define as smart? And then that's my last slide. Uh, I hope it wasn't too long. It's not just the building technology, but what you're building, people and processes do with that technology. Uh, the highest level of building intelligence is building adjustments driven by flawless AI, driven decision-making, which it's on its way, but we don't believe it exists yet. Um, there's a lot of really good things happening with automation, but we're not there yet. We, we, uh, and the lowest level of intelligence is data unseen and unactioned. And I think Stanton will agree with me that if you have the data, but you don't do anything with the data, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So human analysis and intervention will always be a part of the building's intelligence. After all, we're the ones that built them and we continue to build them uh, moving forward. So we really see smart building certification as a catalyst to support the human side of, of this story, uh, help people navigate smart buildings and in the end, uh, make better buildings. All right, great. Thanks so much, Nicholas, for this uh, great overview over the smart building certification. My ears kind of pricked up and got very interested when you mentioned that some of your customers who are applying the smart framework have come up with new business models. I would assume that means new revenue streams. Tell us a bit more about it Absolutely. because that always gets excited when we talk about new business opportunities. Can you give us one or two examples of those new business models? Yeah. You know, absolutely. So we have um, we have some buildings. We have a building that we're uh, that we work with in, in Finland, and um, they we, we're always looking at okay, price per square meter for rental or for purchase, right? That's the traditional way of looking at real estate. So we've always asked the question, or at least when we started the certification process, of do you think you're going to get a higher uh, per square meter rental or sale price for your building because it's smart. And these guys actually uh, laughed at us and said, we're not even playing that game. You know, we are looking at, um, you know, flex workspaces, renting things out by the, the hour, renting out amenities by the hour, renting out um, a conference rooms, digital studios, um, gyms, anything you can possibly manage. Uh, but it's it's not, it's, it's being done by, by the data that's coming out and it's all automated and it's, it's pushing uh, the invoices when, uh, when they use it. And, and that's really uh, quite encouraging to see. So they're doing it completely different and, and smart allows you to, to get creative in, in what that is. And I think the, the creativity needs to be tested constantly, but they're very positive and happy with their results so far. So. So, so basically the process of bringing all these stakeholders together that you as well alluded to as one of your uh, primary uh, desired outcomes of a certification process created innovation that led to complete digitalization and new ways of connecting with the customer and bringing the customer in basically. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, like I said in the presentation, the, the sky is endless. There are so many solutions and there's just endless ways of, of looking at these things. Mm. 
And I think it's up to us now to get those those stories out there and get these buildings and these real estate companies to speak with each other. Um, and I also see a very important application of of following the the uh, life cycle of the building, right? For instance, if we look at a building being developed and sold, mm. as an example, if the developer puts all kinds of beautiful technology into this building and then they sell it to somebody else, we see a huge loss in the utilization of that technology because they just don't know that it's in there. So to know that the technology is in there, how to use it and what they can use it for, that's a hugely uh, important piece to this story. Otherwise, we're, we're putting a lot of tech in there and we're not actually utilizing it for what it's worth. Great. That's a good point to hand over to Stanton because Stanton is the man for the technology, the automation, the standards, the monitoring. And uh, Stanton is the president of Reset. Let's hear it from the president himself. And we are looking forward to your insights, Stanton. Welcome and uh, good evening to Shanghai at the moment. All right, all the way from Shanghai. Thanks, Stanton. You're still on mute. Thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you for the reminder as well. Um, cool. So I'm going to breeze through this really relatively quickly. It's a very brief introduction to Reset and how it works. Um, Reset is a data standard and set up tools for healthy and sustainable built environments. Um, the question that we are, we've been asking ourselves for a while and when we started this was, how do we make the built environment more sustainable and healthy with the lowest cost and effort? And the answer that we came up with was that we need to start with data collection and continuous monitoring. So why data collection first? Um, I, I, I personally look at it in three different ways, which is uh, present, past, and future. So in the present, we're looking at operations. How do you uh, better understand how your building um, actually operates? From a past perspective, looking at the history of the building, how it has operated, having the data um, accessible makes it very easy to see how um, the building has performed historically. And then in the future, uh, it's creating actionable plans, uh, looking for optimizations with solutions so that you're targeting actually the, the, the actual issue instead of looking at something um, too broad. And lastly, it's training. So I think that most of us will agree that our future is very data focused and um, basically there's gonna be a lot of data. So the earlier we can bring our facilities teams or um, our internal teams to get used to using and leveraging data, the better. So we really believe that you cannot effectively solve what you cannot measure. Um, our purpose uh, is to help build um, healthier and more sustainable built environments. And the way we're doing this is by standardizing data collection and continuous monitoring. Um, what we do is we do essentially just two things. We develop standards, which are offered out for free. And then on top of that, we build assessment tools and services that layer on top of the standards. And everything um, is towards developing actionable and long-term strategies towards health and, sustainable, uh, and sustainability in built environments. Um, we are focused on operations and on-paper metrics and operational metrics are very different. One of the reasons for that is if you install uh, systems in place at the very beginning uh, of the life cycle of a building, those systems will work similarly to how the on-paper metric says, it, says they will, but over time they will, um, the numbers will uh, change because of maintenance or lack of um, care of certain systems. So they have to be maintained. Operational metrics where you have sensors actually monitoring the performance of these systems will give you much more accurate data. So going through that, um, the difference between Reset and more traditional standards uh, like Lead and Well is that um, Lead and Well is designed more as a design standard. They help you holistically look at every part of the building, what you should consider for sustainability or health. And then once that's done, um, you're not as required um, to look at how the building performs over time. They're not checking you every month. They're not checking you every day. 
They're really just looking at how you perform now and then when you renew three years later. Reset's a little bit different. Our focus is purely on the data. So we're just looking at how do you collect the data? Um, how do you get high quality data and make sure that everything is connected for um, long-term continuous monitoring? The way we view data is we break it down to three different parts. Uh, number one is completeness. Is there enough data? Is all of the data there? Is, is there data missing? Um, we look at the quality of the data. Is the data true? How well does it reflect the actual situation? So um, one of the situations we encountered a long time ago was um, someone placing a air quality monitor in a closet and then using that to represent the air quality in the space. Doesn't really make sense. So that's something we verify for. And then lastly, performance is the is a normal generic kind of data that we see, um, which is how the actual numbers on how it's performing. Performance is only relevant if completeness and quality are also in place. And um, the goal for how we treat data is to make sure it's trusted, actionable, and relevant. Um, this slide is just to describe how we're approaching data holistically. Um, we look at materials um, from a, we, we're building a framework for how to collect materials data. Our focus though is gonna be on the operation, uh, operating data. So air is what we've traditionally done where you've added water, energy, and circularity all focused around continuous monitoring. The goal of it is to essentially make it so that you can collect data, um, have it all available um, and accessible in the cloud, and then, um, make it so that collecting this data does not require someone physically checking, um, checking meters, adding it into Excel list, et cetera. But the focus is on air quality. So I just wanna talk about that real quick. Um, with recent air, the idea is we wanna help you see the invisible. We can't see pollution, uh, air quality pollution very well, especially in indoor environments. So what we wanna do is have sensors to be able to tell you what the actual numbers and readings are. Our focus is on particulate matter, uh, TVOC, which is chemical off-gassing like formaldehyde um, and carbon dioxide, which these three help really look at what, are, what kind of systems are, are in place in the building in terms of fresh air, filtration, um, the, the materials used in the, in the space to guarantee as healthy of an environment as possible. So the way that Reset works is we are, focus purely on the auditing process. We don't build the monitors. We don't build um, the data provider service. The data provider is a software service. So you who would have something similar where their monitors will push data into their servers. Um, we don't do any of that. Our only focus is on the auditing. So the reset cloud is where the data gets compiled from the monitors into the data provider, which then gets packaged into a summary and then sent to the reset cloud for uh, auditing and benchmarking. Um, Reset tackles two types of uh, spaces. One is corn show, which means the entire building, um, from an air quality perspective, we're, we're talking about the air being delivered by the landlord, so air from the HVAC systems, and the commercial interiors is targeting the actual air in an indoor space. So if you treat us as simply as possible, it's landlord versus tenant space. Um, just to reiterate what Reset actually does, we only focus on two things. The standard is free. What we do is we provide audits and certifications so that the data being collected is trusted by a third party audit. And then the second thing we do is analytics and benchmarking. For the audit and certification, we do three levels of audits. One is the documentation audit. That's the initial phase of just checking to make sure it follows all the rules. The site audit is to verify that the systems, the hardware, the software is all installed properly. And then the data audit is something that continues indefinitely, assuming that you're maintaining the certification. For analysts and benchmarking, all of it is towards looking at how do we compare projects apples to apples. Um, so for example, uh, the tenant leaderboard is where we're going with this or the recent leaderboard where you get to compare yourself against other projects anonymously and see how you rank compared to others. Um, Reset is applicable to new buildings, existing buildings, interior spaces, hotels, retail environments, and educational environments, because the focus is on the monitoring. So it's really just 
the mo install the monitors. We're non-prescriptive. We don't tackle the solution side. W whatever solution you implement just has to help you achieve the targets for um, whatever you're monitoring. A really quick case study, um, Tish and Speyer in Shanghai, the way they use Reset is, I'll read the quote really quickly. We use Reset to quickly diffuse air quality issues with tenants. Indoor air quality issues are often generated by tenants and the third party data allows us to show that our systems are running optimally. So in this case, they're using the core and shell standard um, and they certify it so that they can separate the responsibility because their building has a central HVAC system that does mix air from different tenants. And having a strong understanding of what the air quality is being delivered allows them to mitigate a lot of issues with tenants and also be able to offer solutions for their tenants afterwards. Lastly, um, Reset is a base layer standard, standard in the sense that we are focused on data and data quality. So we can help um, fulfill a lot of requirements for other standards um, in the form of crosswalks. And that's all I have for now. So thank you very much. All right, great. Thanks so much, Stanton. And uh, if I can sum it up, you guys are really the, the data guys, the performance guys, and you don't really compete with the other standards, but you try and just focus on, on that niche area and help support the delivery of other standards with those uh, uh, data uh, uh, focused uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to give people a, a better idea of the performance aspect of it, Stanton, I think I can remember you have this separation between acceptable and high performance. Uh, I think I recall for, for carbon dioxide, it was acceptable as 1,000 ppm and high performance is 600 ppm. Uh, can you give us some idea of the other performance areas like total VOC and PM 2.5, where you're uh, where your benchmark lies? Yeah, so for, for PM 2.5, we have 35 micrograms per a meter cubed for regular, and then high performance is at 12. Um, and then TVOC is um, 500 uh, micrograms, uh, milligrams per meter cubed and 400 for high performance. So the, tar the reason why we have these targets is we don't wanna set the initial target, the acceptable target too high, <clears throat> because there are certain regions in the world where they actually have outdoor air quality issues. For mm. areas that don't have outdoor air quality issues and their focus is on high performance where they're optimizing the indoor environment, the high performance targets are more applicable. Great, great. And if I would be uh, an office building in Metro Manila and I would have my core and shell similarly like Spire to make sure I do my job properly and I can as well uh, let my tenants know what's going on and what might be their responsibility linked to the new furniture they just bought that releases the VOC rather than the building releasing VOC. Uh, but what kind of buildings would I get benchmarked against anonymously in your system to give me a bit of a gauge how I'm doing against uh, other similar buildings? So the way that our benchmarking would work, um, it's not finished yet. So the system is being developed and it should be ready by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But the way it would work is we would have a lot of categories. We would, um, you would be able to be, you would be able to apply your building to the different benchmarks in different categories. So we look at how a building is rated um, in terms of like, is it a office um, tower? Is it a mall? Is it a hospital, et cetera? And then we collect, we take all of the hospitals in a region and then we make a benchmark out of those. And then um, you would be able to situate yourself in whichever uh, list that you want to. And mm -hmm. we would work with the different projects to figure out which list that fits them the most. Great, excellent. That's uh, good to give us further insight into how Reset works. Uh, and now I would like to ask uh, Graham Mills. Uh, he is the uh, MD for Air Purifying Limited in the UK with loads and loads of experience in this field. Graham, what's your take on uh, those two presentations that you've just heard and, and what we can learn from it and, and take with us for our uh, practice in our buildings in terms of optimizing uh, uh, health, wellness and sustainability? 
Um, thank you very much for asking me to participate in this. Um, Matthias, just a small point, it's air profiling, not air purifying, it's air profiling limited, yeah. thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, what comes across to me is um, the, the fact that smart buildings um, and the concept of it is relatively new. I know when um, Nicholas was talking uh, about uh, the edge back a few years ago, et cetera, um, but the, the onset of the uh, burgeoning and, uh, of uh, the concept of, um, uh, of smart buildings is, is absolutely enormous. And I think that there is a problem in getting people to get on board with the whole concept. Um, it's rather like, uh, um, you know, we, 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 we didn't really understand how the, uh, the, the pandemic started and what we had to do to overcome it. Um, it, took, it took a while for people to take it on board. Um, with smart buildings, I think it's, it's a much, potentially a much bigger problem. Um, and, and one is sort of thinking that along the lines that um, many organizations would probably want to have somebody whose role is the implementation of uh, smart building measures uh, over a period of time. And part of that program would actually be the education of people, not just the C-suite, uh, to, uh, because of the, the obvious uh, financial benefits of having a small uh, smart building, but also taking on board uh, the, the, uh, the employees or the building occupants. Um, now, this is very difficult in a, a situation where you have a tenant uh, and, and landlord relationship, uh, because you may get tenants in who don't really understand what it's all about. And therefore, there is a sort of huge education aspect um, to, to bring them on board and uh, to benefit from it. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, um, uh, when, when uh, Stanton was talking about the, uh, the co comparison of performances of buildings, uh, there are the two metrics. One is the core and shell and the other is the, the, the internal. Well, in many ways, you would be looking purely at the core and shell for a comparative purpose. Uh, because then what happens to the air indoors is very much up to the tenant and how he actually regulates the airflow in his space. And, you know, with, a, with some processes in, uh, in those uh, spaces, it could be highly polluting. And the difficulty comes when if that air, as was mentioned earlier on, is mixed back into the, the, uh, the um, air supply system, uh, that then gets dispersed into other areas as well, so that the neighboring tenant is suffering from the pollution that is actually occurring in the first tenant's uh, um, uh, premises. So the, getting the, the, the real problem is education uh, and ensuring that people don't reach a point of paralysis through analysis or in a state of... Uh, um, being overwhelmed by data, but actually information poor. Uh, so they say data rich and inform information poor. And I think that this applies in this. Um, I think the objectives are absolutely right in every respect. Everything that Nicholas has said, I, un I understand the way he's pulling everything together. Uh, but the key thing that Nicholas was saying was getting people on board uh, and having the integrated approach. Um, and Stanton was, was actually uh, saying very much the same thing because there are two levels of, um, of, uh, the, uh, of the standards, if you like. You have the core and the shell and the, and the uh, indoor. So that's where I feel that the, the main problem is. It's all about the communication, all about the, uh, uh, getting people to share um, the, the, the objectives and to understand the objectives that is not just better for the, uh, for, for the building or the, t the tenant um, company or the, uh, or the landlord himself. It's actually better for them as occupants of the building and as, as uh, employees hard at work. Um, and I, I know from my own experience that some of the, uh, the air quality that I've seen in um, offices is absolutely appalling, absolutely dreadful. Uh, and you know, seeing, uh, seeing levels of CO2, for example, as one of the primary indicators of uh, in ventilation, uh, approaching 3,000 parts, per, parts per, per million. And not just once, but again and again and again. And you can see the curve 
uh, of uh, the, um, the rising levels of, part, uh, of uh, CO2 every single day in that classic top hat shape of, of graph. So that's where I am with this. There's, there's a, uh, the education side of it and getting the, the starting from the bottom and from the top at the same time on the education side. And I think comp companies, the big companies need to have not just sustainability managers, but people who um, are uh, have their responsibility and knowingly amongst all the other all the other people in the building that they are smart building specialists and their role is actually to make the environment really smart that's it that sounds great excellent you were getting a lot of nods there uh, graham Absolutely. and i think we have uh, an enhanced importance on this subject of working together because we are fighting an airborne virus that uh, is heavily influenced by how we are managing the air exchange in our buildings. And that's why uh, monitoring and optimizing is, is even more critical than ever before. But I think that's an opportunity for us as well to bring this topic to the front of the queue rather than the end of the queue, because it's been kind of difficult in the past. I've seen landlords that are kind of want to hide this data or they're not going into it because they think, oh, if my tenant knows that I have a problem, then, you know, I maybe have some liabilities. But, you know, we are quickly arriving at a point where I think it's flipping around, where people expect this and want to know what's going on. And if you don't have that data and you cannot show that you're doing the right thing, then you're in trouble. But Graham, you were still in a rather low CO2 level building. I've been with my Yahoo in a meeting room in a bank in the Philippines with a CO2 level in the meeting room of 7,000 PPM, <laughs> not 3,000. So there are worse case scenarios that are worse uh, unbelievable, than, than what you've unbelievable. experienced. Yeah. If, if, if we had a situation where, where you, in a classroom, we had that level of um, CO2, mm. the kids would be asleep or they would mm. be going uh, you know, amok um, because mm. their brains just can't handle um, what's happening to them. Yeah, and yeah. where they re where they measure some of the highest levels is when we do those standardized tests for kids. We bring them all into one room, and that's when they're supposed to perform at their ultimate best and you know deliver the results. Mm. And that's when we're seeing the highest numbers as well. It's it's we we definitely need to put attention to it. Yeah, let me start off with the first question from Gavin here. And I have a couple of questions that came in in advance with the registration. I have one super interesting question there as well that I'll share after I, I read Gavin's question. I believe there is a trade-off between air exchange rate, ACH, and energy consumption. Uh, higher ACH will lead to a higher energy consumption due to uh, loads of uh, conditioned air. What is the panel's point of view on how to achieve the optimum balance? Very good question. Uh, more more current than ever before now with our COVID scenario. Um, I, I, can I answer that? I, I, I think that the the answer is having uh, some sort of uh, uh, monitoring system where the ventilation is on demand, uh, just to make life a lot easier for for everybody. Um, if you uh, have a situation where you are just blasting air in to increase the, uh, the air changes per hour, then yes, your costs are going to rocket up. And similarly, if you, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> if you decide that you're going to crank them down, uh, the, the air, air flow, then you're going to be getting a rise in uh, pollutants. And therefore, you really need to have um, the demand controlled ventilation, uh, which says, okay, we have a problem with uh, O3 or whatever it might be, or CO2, and therefore we need to uh, get the, um, uh, the ventilation uh, speed up and increase the air changes per hour until some, till the, uh, the value is returned to the ins inside the thresholds. Thanks, Graham. I think Stanton, you were getting ready to uh, chip in as well, yeah? Yeah, just to, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with Graham, just to build off of that a little bit. Um, we've always talked about ACH air exchange rates traditionally because we had no other way to measure it, right? So all like ASHRAE standards, all standards build upon the concept of ACH. Um, if you had the ability to monitor the air in the building, you don't have to consider ACH nearly as much because you now have a target that you're trying to achieve. 
if you have CO2 levels that are too high, you increase fresh air. If you have TVOC that's too high, you increase fresh air. If you have PM 2.5 that's too high, you increase filtration. So you can tailor the system to optimize for when something is actually happening. For example, if you have an office, especially during now, um, when there's actually much fewer people in the office, you don't have to have that much fresh air being brought in because there's just less people in the space. So instead of looking at hard numbers that are static that can't change depending on the number of people in the building, um, having a monitor that actually reflects the actual situation of the building will allow you to optimize for energy consumption significantly. Great points, excellent. Uh, I will share two questions that came in in advance. Uh, one, uh, which I think is super interesting is how can we automate wellness and energy optimization through those systems and through those certifications? I think that's both for Nicholas and Stanton to share their experience. And then a couple of people were asking as well, how long does it take and how much does it cost to achieve your respective certifications? A couple of people wanted a little bit more detail on the process and, and the time and, and money, money uh, uh, implications. Maybe Nicholas, you can start it off. Sure, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll start. I think, so with the energy and, and those, that question, it's, it's very much similar, I believe, to the, the air quality. It starts with data. It, it starts with uh, data on the most detailed level you can get it, right? Because if we're looking at it on, on our meter readings, that's one, but we should actually be going much deeper into you know, socket level and where is the energy being used. And from that, you can then uh, make corrective decisions and demand control. As Graham was saying, there's a lot of technology in there and how do you bring different technologies and different solutions together to get integrative design where you can actually say, if I do this here, it's gonna make adjustments there. So. There's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of different ways of, of, of looking at it. And um, it's just about getting started. Start small if you if you need to, but um, test, retest, and, and experiment and, and find better ways to do it. Uh, as far as our process is concerned, we, um, we have uh, a philosophy where we think a lot of certifications can be quite uh, expensive and challenging to achieve. Um, and we, we would like it to, uh, we, we don't want to see the haves and the have nots of smart buildings and non smart buildings. So, we've really priced our certification uh, as, as reasonable as possible, where we uh, charge uh, seven, 7,895 euros for any building below this uh, 10,000 square meters. If you go above 10,000 square meters with the bigger building, it, it adds a little bit, uh, but, but not much. And the whole process takes uh, about uh, uh, four weeks after the assessment has been filled in. Once the assessment has been filled in, uh, we have built a, a peer review model, which we've taken from the academic world, where we have experts from all around the world who look at the qualitative aspects of your smart building. They look at your governance, they look at your integrative design, they look at the things that can't be black and white measured. They look at the things that are, are more um, uh, fluid and, uh, and give you reading on that. So not only uh, what you're doing well, but also the things that can be improved. And that just takes time because there's people working on, on your assessment. So the whole process takes about uh, a month. Great, Stanton? Um, I'm not gonna, the energy and air quality question, I think it's been already answered. It's really just match the, match the data in the same, um, uh, specificity, like how, if it's every five minutes, you want it to be every five minutes for both sides, and you can see how the data trend together, and you optimize for that. Um, having targets for both will make it easier to for the system to kind of learn if you're going with an AI system, but um, definitely starting with data is going to be the way to optimize. Um, in terms of time, um, we do three processes, uh, three audits. The documentation audit and the site audit can both in the most optimal situation be done within one month. So um, that's the fastest. Typically we see three months because it takes some time for uh, planning. It takes some time for communication. There's a lot of parties involved. So three months is the average that we see. And then to get certified, you need another three months. So um, three months of 
collecting data and you actually have to pass all three months consecutively to get certified. And if you don't pass the three months, um, if you miss one month, you basically reset the cycle and you're, you maintain a status um, that we call accredited. Um, and we're, we're indefinite. So if you fail three months consecutively, once you're certified, you also will drop back down to accredited uh, status. Uh, in regards to price, I'm just gonna show a real quick screenshot. Um, this is the pricing mechanism that we have. It's just based on size. And um, the first year includes the one-time documentation and site audit as well. And then second year onwards is the data audit um, that is a required fee every year. And the calculator is on our website. It's um, completely public. We don't mess with the pricing. All right, great, excellent. That gives a very good, good overview. It's all public there. You can uh, go on the website. I think it's the same with Nicholas. Uh, we've got a couple of more interesting questions coming in. Um, we had one question in advance that was talking about how we can use the IAQ data to uh, drive ESG score improvements. We've actually decided to run a, a, a complete webinar on that topic uh, in the near future as well. IAQ and ESG, particularly for listed companies who get scored on ESG by the rating agencies, but it will be very relevant for the non-listed companies. So maybe you can park that till we do that webinar. Uh, we have Elmar here who is asking about, do we need more guidelines and stricter guidelines for indoor air quality? And uh, uh, Ian is asking, do we have enough qualified maintenance staff to undertake monitor and reporting of all these? Maybe Graham, you can give a quick uh, uh, first response to that. I think I think that um, uh, it is it, it is most definitely a problem for sure. Yeah. So that's why we need the systems, right? Yeah, So absolutely. that we don't need yep. too many uh, 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 maintenance staff. But we need the maintenance I, I, staff to be to be trained and made aware, the awareness and the understanding, what does it mean? And then together with the alerts that you will get when you who has the alerts built in, Stanton has his uh, thresholds, then you get a notification, then you can take action, right? Yeah, I think I think that the, the, key, the key to it, though, is, again, uh, going back to uh, training people and getting them to understand what it means. Uh, certainly, if you um, control your air quality, um, you do achieve the you can achieve fairly easily the balance between uh, the cost of um, uh, running the HVAC system and the uh, the health and welfare of um, the employees, and that is so important to, as far as the sustainability and CSR um, uh, policies are concerned. Uh, but excuse me. But training, I think, is is the key to it to making sure that people actually understand what the data is and how to use it. Um, and you know, the the amount of data that we're talking about is absolutely enormous. I don't think that people really uh, understand the fact that we're not talking about megabytes or gigabytes. We're talking about petabytes and more. Um, so. Uh, um, th th this really, for me, is the is the area of primary concern. Yeah, and if I could add to that, I think what we also need to keep focused on is that the the generational competencies on on maintenance and management of all of these systems is also changing. We're getting many more facility managers and 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 the younger generation focusing on the smart technology, but not necessarily the the ventilation systems and these types of things that need to be maintained. So that's something that we need to, to always be looking at. And, and what we're saying from smart building certification, and it's, it's not happening yet, but if we look at integrative design of smart buildings, we have very different scenarios happening. We have buildings that are doing absolutely everything and they're putting in 36, 40 different technologies to manage absolutely everything, which is, on one side, really amazing that they're doing everything. So that's great. But as time goes, we need to be looking at that integrative design to be using the smallest technical layer possible for the maximum impact. Because if we continue to build way too technical buildings, that all needs to be managed, maintained, and, and operated. 
Um, so the, the more streamlined we can become, the less technology with the maximum impact, I would say, is, is important. Yeah, we're running short on time. So I'd like to have Stanton quickly comment on, do you think we need stricter legislation, enforcement, and government-linked uh, IAQ standards? And how does uh, what you do with Reset help with Singapore PCA Greenmark, for example? And then we'll do the video and the exit poll. I can answer the first question. I am not mm -hmm. familiar enough with Singapore VCA Greenmark to, to really answer that question. Um, from a government perspective, I think having more regulation will definitely help our industry. Um, the one thing to note is that it depends on how they do the regulation. If it's regulation focused around specific solutions, for example, how many filtration you want to have in the building or how many, like how, what should the spec of a, of a fresh air unit be? Those are going to be slightly limiting. It, it limits creativity. It limits kind of the different options for solutions for an interior space. Um, I think that the approach around data and just have, like requiring buildings to collect the data and display the data in a highly accurate way, I think is going to be the most valuable. Um, obviously, there is that fear that Matthias mentioned earlier of actually releasing this data if the data is bad. But there should be a drive, let's say a five-year plan towards that so that buildings are now consciously making an effort to make that upgrade. Yeah. We will do uh, quick. Uh, yeah. OK, Graham, just very quickly. Yeah. Very, very quick one to say that the world building standard, of course, asks um, or does require uh, information to be relayed to the building occupants. And a lot of this very technical information uh, needs to be translated into simple uh, language for people to be able to see it on smart screens in and around the building. Yeah, let me just do quickly the video and the exit poll, and then we will try and answer the BCA Greenmark question and Steve's question as well, uh, subsequently, so we can overrun a little bit, hopefully. All right, uh, can you just quickly uh, shoot the video, and then I will do the exit poll. Tenants are worried about the air they breathe in their workplace due to COVID-19. Science has shown that poor indoor air increases the risk of coronavirus surviving and spreading through the air. Your tenant's safety may be at risk if they are exposed to poor air quality, resulting in worsened allergies and asthma, and may lead to long-term illnesses. Tenants who don't feel safe and comfortable are not likely to stay. There's never been an easy way to deal with problems in the air, until now. Yuhu Aura continuously monitors all the important things in the air so you know exactly what to do to improve it. View real-time and historical data of all your locations and manage them from one dashboard. Get alerts if any of your buildings exceed safety limits so you can immediately take action. You'll get tips on what you can do to reduce the risk and ensure the safety of your tenants 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yuhu, take control, ensure safety, Reduce churn. All right, excellent. Uh, and let's do the uh, exit poll as well uh, that I will just uh, kind of pull in quickly. There we go. I'll launch it. Can you please just quickly answer whom you want to follow up with? And then we can give your contact details to the relevant people. Stanton, you want more information on Reset. Nicholas, you want more uh, uh, smart building certification info. Graham Mills, our man from Air Profiling who does the air purifying. <laughs> and uh, uh, you who or myself, uh, please let us know who you want to follow up with. And then we have another three questions. Uh, another question came in that we will do after the exit poll for those who can still stay on after the hour. If any of the speakers need to leave, uh, no worries. Feel free to do so if you have a, a continuing event. I will try and tackle the BCA Greenmark question uh, if nobody else is around to take that on. And then uh, uh, we will share the other two questions. Okay, let me uh, share here. Stanton, you are the most popular one. Uh, we've got 70% of the people who answered who want to follow up with you. And then Nicholas and Graham, uh, oh, you who with 60%. I'm the least popular with 20%. Valang <laughs> problema. 
we can live with that. Okay, let's look at the questions that are still open here. We've got um, uh, Steve who is asking, please comment on automated demand control for homes now to meet occupant targets for carbon dioxide, relative humidity, PM 2.5. Graham, is that something that you can have a, 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 a go at? Have you got any experience with automated demand control for homes to kind of try and uh, uh, link that in with the data monitoring? You're on mute, I think. We can't hear you. I beg your pardon. There we go. Um, in a word, no. Uh, I haven't had experience of uh, building automated control in uh, private residences as yet. Um, although we have got uh, contact with um, a couple of organizations who deal with uh, uh, um, very high caliber uh, ventilation in um, private uh, premises and so on. And um, I'm hoping that we will have that experience. But I, at this point in time, the answer is no. Yeah. I mean, I do manual control here at home. I have my Yuhu to monitor. I sometimes have problems with uh, high CO2 levels because my office is in, in an inner room that has no outdoor window. And I close the, the other partition window to make it, uh, to reduce the noise from my kids. So uh, that's why I need to manually just open up the uh, door here to get my CO2 levels down. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't, I haven't yet got an automated door opener. So I'm, I'm not so sure whether I can give you a good answer for that as well, Steve. But uh, if anyone else has, Nicholas or Stanton, any comments on that? Uh, otherwise, we will move uh, to the next question here from Mary. How many square meter does one device cover? Maybe, Graham, you can answer that because you're dealing with the Yuhu device on a day-to-day -day basis. How many square meters uh, uh, does it cover? I, it will depend very much on uh, the layout of the space. Uh, for example, um, we know that an air in certain spaces can be extremely dynamic um, and uh, that it, the flow can be interrupted by um, uh, partitions, walls, doors, whatever it might be. Um, generally speaking, if you want granular information uh, in, an, in a space, then you would be looking at uh, one uh, monitor per 50 square meters. Um, but generally, in, in uh, broader terms, in most buildings, we work on around about 80 to 100 square meters per, per monitor. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I see Stanton is already uh, commenting on Ian's question. He is basically making a statement here that uh, uh, the construction of new buildings or refurbishment of old buildings to meet all this new infra within the building structure will increase cost by at least 20%. I think that's all a question of how you go about it. Stanton is, is typing an answer. I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm sure Nicholas doesn't necessarily agree with that because how you achieve those objectives of healthy air quality can be done many different ways. And sometimes if you do it holistically, uh, uh, you can avoid the cost of additional equipment that would otherwise be needed. But that's just, uh, you know, Stanton's answer will come in pretty soon anyway. We had the BCA Greenmark question here. I mean, BCA Greenmark is maybe closest to lead of all the systems and standards that you have been mentioning earlier. And it's, it's classically very much as well driven by the design criteria but it has increasingly moved towards performance in operation as well. So I think both Reset and uh, Reset in its data focus will help a lot with achieving the uh, BCA Greenmark requirements. And the smart building certification can work with that as well. It's not a competition. And it helps a lot with the process of getting all the stakeholders together. Sometimes the problem with classical standards like LEED or BCA Greenmark has been, you know, you get a consultant in and then the architect and engineer have already done all of their designs, their drawings, and then the consultant is limited to adding additional equipment, which then pushes up the cost to achieve the points to get certified. But if you do it properly with the holistic approach, like really discussing what is the optimum solution, 
and or focusing on the operational performance like what Stanton Standard does, you don't necessarily need to add that much expensive additional costs and equipment. So I think it's about the process that you actually apply. So BCA Greenmark can be very much supported with both uh, standards and certifications that you have uh, been introduced today. So I think we had uh, uh, already the answer here uh, from uh, um, Stanton with the 20%. And uh, maybe I'll read his answer. Assuming that we're talking about government creating targets, I would argue that the goal shouldn't be set hard targets, but the required transparency and use gamification and social pressure to uh, push improvements. This is interesting. This is now about the actual performance improvement we achieve over time, right? And this is as well uh, built into the PCA. The uh, Singapore government has started initially with so many uh, 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 percentage need to meet it, and then all the government buildings should meet it, and then progressively pushed higher. So gamification is very, very interesting, and it will give an excuse for higher end buildings to upgrade their system. For everyone else, it's minor cost for adding a few monitors. Yeah, so some of it is behavioral change. Some of it is awareness and knowledge of the uh, maintenance people and the uh, building uh, managers. So the actual uh, improvement can come from many sides. So maybe I would suggest uh, we just have each of you one minute, your conclusion from today and the uh, learning tips that you want to give people uh, uh, to take home with. And the uh, recording will be shared on the YouTube channel. Uh, and I want to thank as well uh, um, Cheska and Lilette who have been in the background making this happen. Uh, you don't see the ladies here, you just see their name, but big thanks to them because they put, pulled everything together. And um, yeah, maybe we start off with Graham. One minute from your side, Graham, what are the main learning points for you from today that you want to share as take home tips for the participants? Yeah, the, fir the first uh, uh, lesson I think that we, we have is that there are some very, very good um, uh, standards out there and there are some very good solutions in order to achieve those standards. Um, and I think this has been recognized by um, uh, Nicholas and his uh, uh, smart building um, uh, certification. Um, and the, the, the key though is, as I keep coming back to it, is education and training and getting people to understand what it's all about. And I think that it's got a very good future. I would like to see perhaps a little bit more um, global standardization if it can be achieved. Um, and uh, particularly on air quality. And I know the comments were made about um, regional differences, et cetera. Um, but I'd like to see things coming together a bit more. We do have a number of um, standards, the well, the, the fit well, the reset and, and BRIAM, we have uh, LEED and we have well buildings and so on. And I, I would like to see some sort of effort to bring some of these standards into one compilation rather than having uh, disparate um, uh, sources of information. Great. And uh, maybe Nicholas? Yeah, I, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for having us. I think it was uh, a fantastic conversation. Great to hear uh, Stanton and, and Graham. And I completely agree with Graham. I think SMART, it's, it's still early days. And I think everybody is, is working to try and figure out how it all works and how it all pieces together. And I would say that the most important thing is, is to start from where you are. I think a lot of people think, we're too far gone to build a smart building. We are already further too far in the process or we have an existing building and uh, it's, it's too capital intensive to, to make it happen. But um, as we build these case studies, as we see the results, we see that there's actual uh, verified uh, you know, proof that this stuff works. So I would say wherever you are in your process, start, start to experiment with things, start to find uh, the data models. And of course, uh, the further along you go, the, the more exciting it gets because there's just more and more to uncover and, and explore. And there's a lot of standards out there uh, and a lot of organizations that can support. So 
um, don't hesitate to, to call out and ask. Uh, we do a lot of events that are completely free as well. Um, I know that all of our partners do events just like you, uh, the other certifications do events. So you can, you can gather a lot of information uh, in that way as well. I know that we're all a little bit Zoom fatigued and, uh, and event overload, but um, I would just say get started and, and experiment and have fun with it. Great. And your takeaways, Stanton? Um, my takeaway, there's, my takeaway mainly is that there's a lot of community building for us to do. So, um, I would say that the two things that we should think about the most is education and communication. So educating ourselves help after that, educating others and working together to kind of build this community because IAQ is still, I mean, there's a lot more conscious effort to understand IAQ with, um, with COVID, but it's still very nascent. Um, so a lot of it is going to be figuring out how to learn more about it and then figure out how to teach more people about it. Great education. Excellent. And uh, just two more comments based on the comments I've seen. Uh, Mary Grace was asking about uh, reference projects in the Philippines. Uh, I think uh, maybe we will uh, as well uh, give you a, a follow up afterwards. And Elmer, who commented earlier, he can give reference projects about you who uh, monitoring in different buildings in the Philippines. And uh, Ian, with your question about extra costs, Google the Singapore case study, United World College. It's a very old case study, but they actually saved 7% of construction costs by radical efficiency innovation. They achieved lead platinum But lead platinum was not their goal. Their goal was maximum efficiency at lowest cost, very much in line with what Stanton said, you know, how, how can we get maximum output at lowest cost by focusing on the operational data monitoring and what Nicholas has shared, they used that process of bringing all the stakeholders together, empowering engineers, architects, buyers to come up with the most cost effective solutions. So sustainably certified and healthy buildings don't need to be more expensive. If you get it right, they can save you gigantic amounts of money during the whole life cycle and give you massive added value through healthier employees and higher productivity and more energy efficient buildings. So there is loads of benefit in this. Thanks everybody for participating today. Thanks you who for setting this up. And big thanks to our free speakers contributors. It was my pleasure to be with you all tonight and see you again uh, next month with another exciting webinar where we will focus on ROI, return on investment from all of this. And I think it will be on the 23rd of September at uh, 4 p.m. in the afternoon, Singapore time. See you then. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.